Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjerko, Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He covers a lot of charts for gold, gold mining, global macro. For around 15 or 20 years now, I've known him for, I think, 15 years. He's been covering the gold and silver markets and the gold stocks as long as I have over at the Daily Gold. He's a chartered market technician and a master of financial technical analysis. Jordan Roy Byrne, thank you for joining me again. Hey, Jason. Thanks so much for having me back. It's uh, always a pleasure to be on your show. So, Jordan, we're recording this interview on Tuesday, December 12th, 2023. Quickly, the dollar index is at 103.8, so it's kind of range bound, but it's been trending higher for the last six weeks, I would say, give or take. The oil price is very weak in the last uh, month or so. It's been down substantially. The gold price, the paper gold and silver prices in U.S. dollars have been retreating a little bit, although in the last two weeks they did have one big spike, and now we're back down, I think, to $1,982 gold price, and the silver price is back below 23 at $22.80. But before we talk about gold and silver, I want to get your thoughts on Treasury bond yields the last couple of months, because it's been kind of a roller coaster. If you look at like a two- or three-month chart of the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield, it looks more like a meme stock or a penny stock than it does the most liquid market in the world. So what are your thoughts here on bond yields, U.S. Treasury bond yields? And do you think that that's affecting all these other asset prices a lot? Yeah, certainly. I, I think it is. Uh, if you look at, in particular, long-term bond yields, whether you're looking at the 30-year or the 10-year bond yield, um, I, I think going back over the last couple of years, uh, when the stock market has had these big sell-offs, the first one, I, I think, I mean, I don't have the chart in front of me, but I think you saw a pretty sharp rise in long-term bond yields. It wasn't at the beginning, you know, because they were so low and, and then they started to rise, you know, when you go from one or two to 3%, uh, it, it's not, you know, it's not that big of a deal. It doesn't really become restrictive. It's really once you kind of get close to 5%. And I so I think uh, the decline that the stock market had um, going into, I think that, uh, I want to say that that low in October of 2022, um, you know, if I have the timing right, that, that first leg down in the stock market, uh, towards the end of that, you had the 10-year bond yield was creeping higher. And, and then it consolidated for a number of months. And during that consolidation, the stock market recovered and went up, and then when it started to move up again, uh, this uh, this year, earlier this year, you know, around the middle of the year, around that time, uh, it started to move up again, and it got pretty close to five percent uh, a month or two ago. And of course, that's you know, it 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 stopped at reverse course, and uh, of course, bond yields coming down. Um, you know that's helped the stock market and other risk assets. So I think that um, we kind of could be coming into a new paradigm where, and and you saw this, you know, earlier this year, where uh, you know higher long term bond yields that caused the stock market to sell off. And then towards the end of that move, and and not at the beginning of it, but towards the end of that move, uh, you started to see gold was holding up a lot better. I mean, of course, there were some geopolitical factors, but you know, we were getting pretty close to a bear steepening. Uh, in other words, where the the ten year yield was going up so fast it almost um, undercut or surpassed the two year yield. Did you get that? You know, bear steepening where the the yield curve, which has been inverted for so long. I mean, when it shoots above zero, that's a recession signal. It got really close to that, uh, but of course, that's you know as, as the ten-year yield has rebounded, and the yield has, uh, or I should say, as the bond has rebounded and the yield has come back, um, you know, the, then the yield curve has resumed flattening. Uh, but I, I do think that, um, uh, and historically, if you look at a ten-year yield and you go back and you look at, like, let's say, a hundred-year chart, it peaked in nineteen twenty, uh, around you know five point two, five point three percent, something like that. And what's really interesting is um, you had another inflationary peak in 51, 1951. And then, of course, everybody knows about the peak in 1980. But you go back, the secular bull market in the S&P ended in the late 60s, like at the end of 1968. But it was really precipitated by the 10-year yield. You go back to, I want to say, 1966, 67, around that time, 
once the 10 year yields, once it broke above the 1920 peak, you know, again, this is 5.3, 5.4%, something like that. That really triggered the end of uh, the secular uh, bull market in the stock market. And so this time around, you know, recently you come back to the last couple months and the 10 year yield basically peaked around 5%, you know, more or less, maybe it was 4.95 or whether you're using intraday or the daily or weekly close. But, um, and yes, we're having, you know, what looks to be a counter trend move uh, in bond yields. And if we are going to get a recession and a downturn, you'll certainly see yields will come down even further. Uh, but in the very, the very big picture, um, you know, eventually when we get another move higher, in long-term bond yields and you see the 10-year yield go above five percent like that historically when it gets to that level and it goes above that's when it really starts to become restrictive as far as a bull market and stocks in the economy so i i I do think i mean it's not super obvious but i do think in the last year or so if you're watching markets carefully and you know you shouldn't always base everything on correlations but it, it is clear based especially this year where you had that rise towards uh 5% in the 10 year yield that really started to hurt the stock market it had that decline in recent months so well, especially, I, I, I especially that- small caps i mean look there was a huge divergence between the magnificent 7 where a lot of capital was still going in the big the seven large cap tech companies versus the russell 2000 the small caps cuz those companies the small caps they were planning on using artificially cheap debt for their growth and then with the interest rates priced off the 10 year right around 5% i mean they couldn't raise they rationally if you're running any cash flow projections it was dumb for them to use any debt for growth right and then the the stronger companies like the you know big seven or magnificent seven whatever they however they term those that they those larger stronger companies they could just you know buy t-bills and get five percent so that's also helped some companies but you're right uh it's definitely hurting uh the smaller companies which are more indebted but um, now we're now we're starting to hear like kind of the opposite. So now that like the 10 year US Treasury yields have come down and we've come down from what five around five percent six weeks ago, and now we're I think around four point three percent, give or take on the 10 years treasury. So it's a big move. Again, it's a roller coaster on the on the yields. And you're starting to hear the narratives that the Fed has tamed inflation, inflation is dead, the CPI is going to be down to the 2% Fed target. We're starting to hear that the Fed, we're starting to hear, I was watching Fox Business on, so these are generalist money managers that come on TV almost every day or a couple times a week on regular business television. They're talking about how the Fed's going to start planning on cutting rates in the first couple quarters, 2024. And then they're talking about now, because the rates are coming down excuse me, because the rates are coming down the quote unquote everything rally. So that's like short covering. And then that's like all these going back from risk off and the um, magnificent seven and then money going into short term treasuries, gold, Bitcoin. um, Well, the gold futures or gold ETFs, physical gold. So the more risk, quote unquote, risk off stuff, short term U.S. treasuries, money markets back on to quote unquote risk on back and forth. Right. And and that's and and that's the prevailing view right now is that we're going to have a soft landing like that's what's being discounted by the broader market uh you're having um you know a rally in stocks and bonds and some of that some of that also filtered into gold i think with the expectations that rate cuts are coming i know we'll talk more about gold in detail later but um but that, yeah, with with respect to gold, that's not really sustainable when you know you see money, or when you when you see stocks and bonds rallying in this environment, uh, that that's not good for gold in the short term. But yeah, it, it's part of the this larger narrative that the market thinks we're having a soft landing, and and that's what it's discounting right now. So you think then, and we we're you were telling me this before we start recording that this time, if the Fed starts to cut rates, that that actually wouldn't be good for stocks because really since two thousand eight and two thousand nine, for our listeners out there, when the Fed has started to cut rates a lot down to zero and and started to do the quantitative easing program, regardless of how the real economy was doing in two thousand nine onwards, and then again in twenty twenty, I mean we had big stock market rallies and rallies in asset prices. So you think that this time will that will not happen? 
I think it just depends. It depends on the economy just to, to keep it as simple as possible. And looking at this historically, um, if, the, if they're cutting rates and, and the economy is in a soft landing and that continues, then that's really bullish for the stock market. And you're right. That's what we've had for a while. But if they're cutting rates because the economy is going into a recession and they can see that they have to get ahead of that, you know, like we saw in um, you know 2007 to 2008, as well as uh, in 2000 to 2001. I mean, if, if those are points where the Fed cut and the market still went down. So it, it all comes down to the economy. I mean, if you're in the recession camp or the soft landing camp. And so I, I tend to be more in the uh, the camp that, you know, I, I, I think the Fed, they really don't want to cut rates. So they're only going to cut rates materially if there is a recession. If there's a soft landing, I don't see them cutting rates that much. So I think if in, in the market, as you know, the market discounts this in advance. Like if you see the two-year yield, you see bond yields start dropping. You see the two-year yield really plunging. And then you see the yield curve steepening, shooting above zero. That that That's that's a signal of almost an imminent recession and imminent uh, rate cuts. And so, so in that scenario, um, I think the... Again, if you have a recession, the market is going to decline. Um, you know whether they, regardless of if they're if they're quick to cut rates or not. I mean, I guess you could say, well, if they really wait a long time to cut rates and they you know let the market fall twenty or twenty five percent, and then they start cutting rates, then maybe the market bottoms, th- you know, three or four or five months after the fact. And it's good for the market, but my larger point is, you know, if it look if if we're going to have a recession and they start cutting rates like early in that process, like right as the stock market is rolling over, the market will keep going down. Um, you know, obviously not forever because the cutting rates will help the economy at some point. But um, it just comes back to like cutting rates is not a good thing unless you think the economy is in a soft landing. Well, cutting rates might create more zombie companies because then some of the companies, instead of going bankrupt, they'll refinance and they'll survive. But the U.S. federal government, I mean, at the current spending pace, I mean, they're going to need lower rates at some point because the spending is just the budget deficits are just out of control. Around eight trillion of U.S. Treasury debt needs to be refinanced, I think, in the next 12 months. Uh, at much, much higher rates than it was even a couple of years ago. But honestly, I think the problems in the global economy, as bad as things are here in the U.S. with stagflation, shrinkflation, Bloomberg News ran a piece a couple of weeks ago about how the input costs are up way more than, than the consumer price index, over 20% across the board for a lot of input costs over the last two or three years. I think the problems are way worse in the European Union, China, emerging markets. And I think that's why the dollar index and the dollar on a relative basis is a lot higher versus the other currencies. So, yeah, you have the U.S., the real rates are higher or the relative interest rates are higher than other uh, governments and central banks. And we're hearing other central banks talk about rate cuts already. But um, I think the global economy, a lot of these other countries are not doing as well. I mean, I'm hearing rumors. We just had Argentina announce what a huge peso devaluation with Malay. He he inherited such a mess there. He can't go to gold or, gold or silver standard immediately. He has to do things in stages. But um, I'm hearing... Jordan, of like an, an RMB Chinese yuan devaluation. I'm speaking with uh, Chinese uh, hedge fund managers that are China experts, and they're telling me that like there could be a huge um, devaluation soon coming out of China. And that's why a lot of Chinese people are buying enormous amounts of physical gold. They're buying um, $3 million more apartments in Tokyo. They're just panicking about a currency devaluation. And it seems that that's c- pretty common for these other currencies relative to the dollar. Yeah, they're certainly all so much weaker than the dollar. And if you look at gold prices, the price of gold just looks completely different against foreign currencies than it does in U.S. dollar terms. I mean, of course, it's you know really really close to making this epic breakout, but it's already it's it's so far above that in terms of all these other currencies. Uh, but one one other thing about the dollar from a, a bird's eye view perspective, uh, secular bull markets in uh, the dollar have lined up with the stock market. Of course, we don't have that many cycles. You know, we don't, can only go back to 1973 or so. But, um, 
you look at the uh the secular well well the the, the secular let me go back for a second the secular bears in the dollar of course you have one in the 70s and you, know, you had one from 2001 to 2008 or 2011 however you want to measure it of course the dollar went up uh for you know most of the 80s and then most of the 90s with that huge boom in the stock market and you know the dollar has gone up since 2011 or 2014 i mean it hasn't made a new high since 2022 you know it hasn't been the prettiest move overall but um so in a secular sense the us dollar is aligned with the stock market and so you know the the earlier i was talking about you know we had this um interest rates got to a certain level it helped cause the uh, end of the bull market in the 1960s and so i'm looking for something you know potentially similar to happen um you know at some point over the next couple of years and so in other words you know once the secular bull market in the S&P and US stocks ends that's going to lead to you know a secular bear market in the dollar if, if you go back to the last cycle uh the stock market of course it peaked in March of 2000 with the the tech crash but the dollar peaked um i think late 2001 so i that that's why i'm not i'm not ruling out i mean of course it could happen differently this time but so i i think a lot of the bearishness on the u.s dollar i i I think we need to see the the u.s stock market crack first and that uh that secular uh the secular bull end and you know when that when that happens uh you know that's when the dollar's long-term path will be lower well i'm actually in like the dollar uh trading range camps i call it the dollar tug of war because uh here in D.C., the U.S. Treasury, the Federal Reserve Bank and other enti- government entities, they want to manage the dollar and the exchange rate. They don't want the dollar too strong or too weak because if the dollar is too strong. So if the scenario plays out that Brent Johnson for the, do- the dollar milkshake is predicting and he's predicted a big dollar index spike, I think above 120. But in that scenario, and I've interviewed a bunch of people about this, um, that no euro dollar and the amount of dollar derivatives, dollar denominated debt. They basically said if the dollar index goes above 120, it'll collapse the global economy, it'll collapse the banking system. So I, I'm pretty sure after 2019 that the people in DC and the Federal Reserve Bank and the Treasury are aware of this. So they'll intervene. They don't want the dollar. They're kind of keeping in a trading range where if it gets too strong, they uh, weaken it. And if it gets too weak, they uh, they figure out how to get it to rally. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's uh, that's certainly possible, but we'll we'll see what happens. It's um, you know, I mean, th- th- they definitely want to management manage it, and they can, but um, you know, we'll we'll see what happens and how it plays out. I mean, if the forces are so strong that they it, it if the forces are strong enough, it could push the dollar to a a new high. Even well, all all of these currencies. To, all of these currencies are mismatched. I mean, the Japanese yen against the dollar, wasn't it at a 30 or 40 year low? It got up to almost a 150 Japanese yen to a dollar at one point. So that was like um, a huge devaluation against the dollar. So, I mean, there's like, you have to look at um, the currencies are all relative. So, I mean, the uh, dollar rally would would call cause a global margin call, though, on like all that dollar denominated debt and the derivatives. The people in power are aware of this. So if the dollar rallies too much, I mean, it'll it'll cause immense amounts of problems. It could potentially collapse the entire system. So I think there'd be more currency swap lines, rules changes, bailouts, interventions. I, I, I really, honestly, the more I learn about this, the less I believe in that there's actually free markets anymore. I want to transition now, though, to a piece that uh, George Gammon put out. He put out an excellent video last week, my friend George Gammon over on the Rebel Capitalist YouTube channel. And he was talking about gold and he went back through the 1990s to show different correlations between the gold price and what people. And I've interviewed you about this, too, in the past with the consumer price index, the Fed balance sheet, real interest rates since the 1990s. And he showed that none of those correlations have actually worked in predicting the gold price. So. Do you think that there's actually going to be a correlation for the for the uh, gold price in U.S. dollars and any of those types of things going forward? Yeah, I mean, historically, uh, and for the most part, I mean, nothing is perfect, but, you know, over the last 100 years or so, go, gold correlates with, um, 
declining or negative real interest rates. Um, especially, I mean, there were some points in the eighties and nineties where real interest rates were coming down, but they were so strongly positive that it really didn't matter. So if you're, if real interest rates are around the zero level and they're trending lower, or even if they're, you know, plus one or 2%, they, they trend lower. That's definitely bullish for gold. Um, in the seventies, the correlations were not quite perfect. There were some points where, uh, inflation was shooting up and gold was going higher because, of course, you had rising inflation expectations. And I think you've seen some of that uh, in the last year or so. A part of the reason why gold has held up really well with interest rates, with real interest rates rising so significantly is because you have some money uh, you know, coming out of bonds. You know, You have this, of course, this huge route in the bond market. So some of the money that's been coming out of bonds uh, has been going into gold. I mean, a lot of that has been going into stocks as well. Um, so it's it's to to try and keep. I mean, at least my view historically is you know declining real interest rates. That's the best indicator for gold and gold bull markets. Um, but in the seventies, you had rising inflation and rising inflation expectations. So that when you have those coming in, then the correlation with real interest rates with with uh you know the inverse correlation is not as strong um and it's interesting because there there are periods uh i mean there there were some periods i think in the 80s and 90s just for like a year or two where um gold did go up with inflation like it was going up in the 70s um and you know more recently since 2016 gold has been more uh in line with lower inflation because lower inflation meant easier policy and then you know easier policy means you know, declining real interest rates um but yes i think that in the last year we're we're seeing a shift in that and we also saw this shift um i think in the early 1970s um uh, you, you go back i mean i the gold price was of course, we had the gold standard until 1971. You go back and you look in the 60s, and typically when the Fed cut rates, that's when gold stocks performed really well. And that was still true in, I, I think, um, up to the point, I want to say 1970, I think when they cut rates after that recession and uh, gold stocks bottomed and, and rebounded, of course, and, you know, then gold really took off, you know, or it took off when Nixon, you know, ended the gold standard. Uh, but uh, it, after that point, uh, then uh, precious metals were more correlated with rising inflation. So to come back to the present, I think we're seeing uh, something similar. Now, with that being said, I do think that if we have a recession this coming year, uh, and, and if, you know, maybe inflation comes down a little bit more statistical inflation, you know, again, because if there is a recession infl you know, that probably brings inflation down statistical inflation some more then the fed will have to cut rates. And so that will obviously be bullish for precious metals. I mean, gold, and, and especially if we see, you know, a real bear market in the stock market, but I think, at, I think at, that'll be the last point with respect to this old correlation, you'll probably see a new correlation moving forward where, you know, the higher inflation, higher inflation expectations, uh, that will be, you know, really bullish for gold and silver, like it was in the 1970s. And just another point with respect to all that, you know, th th this is how, you know, interest rates and bond yields play into that. Um, you know, like I said before, you know, once long-term bond yields get up to that 5% level and they go above it, it really becomes restrictive for the stock market and for the economy. And so, you know, essentially we're, we're coming in, coming to the point where you know, the Fed cutting rates and all this printing of money and QE, the Fed doing that is now going to boost commodities and not necessarily the economy. And the reason is because interest rates and bond yields are they're high and they're going to shoot up higher when they do this whereas in the you know last 20 or 30 years they didn't have that problem as we all know you could print money and yeah inflation went up a little bit you know, gold went up but you weren't really seeing it 
really hurt the economy like it did in the 1970s. And so that that's also why um I mean that's why these uh these correlations are going to change because interest rates are going to be much higher and of course that has really negative consequences. Um I mean of course printing money overall I mean we know it has really negative consequences but coming into this new period you know, much like we saw in the 70s, the the high inflation and the much higher bond yields, that's just, it's really bad for markets and the economy. And um, so that that's, that's going to be the huge difference uh, compared to the last, you know, five or 10 or 20 or 30 years. And I think that's why we're seeing, um, we're seeing this change where real interest rates have been moving higher, bond yields have been moving higher, but, you know, the gold price there has held up really well and is, you know, just, biding its time before making an explosive breakout and beginning a real bull market. Well, we're also seeing on the demand side, different level of different types of demand than there was in the past. So in the past, the last 20 or 30 years, you had a lot of foreign central banks, especially outside the G7. They were recycling their trade surpluses and foreign exchange reserves back into U.S. treasuries. And I would argue the last couple of years, that narrative has broken. So a lot of non-G7 central banks are no longer large net buyers of U.S. treasuries. They're buying some of them each month, a sizable amount of gold tonnage. Uh, People's Bank of China, I think 12 months in a row, have publicly said that they've added gold tonnage. You have Poland, you have Brazil, Singapore. Uh, It's all outside of the non-G7. So these are not large net buyers of U.S. Treasuries anymore. Central banks, when they run, um, when the country runs trade surpluses and has foreign exchange reserves, they normally only have a couple options for stuff unless they want to develop a sovereign wealth fund and set up kind of a hedge fund for trading stocks or or, uh, stuff like that. But normally they only buy uh, treasuries or gold tonnage. And you're just seeing instead of buying those treasuries, a lot of the funds are going into gold tonnage. Yeah, and that's um, you know going back to something I think I mentioned before, the fact that you're having you had this huge sell off in bonds and weakness, and so a lot of sovereign money that was in those bonds, some of that money has come into gold, and um, you know, the central bank buying and physical demand has kept gold elevated. You know, otherwise it would probably be at sixteen or seventeen hundred, um, based on where real interest rates are. But we do need to see, you do need to see a recession in the stock market roll over uh, for all that, for a, for a real bull market to begin in gold. Like you can't, it's just central bank buying and physical demand by itself that can't push gold into a bull market. Like you need to see, you know, the Western capital that's invested in, you know, mostly in the stock market, a little bit in bonds. Like you need to see that money. Um, come into the gold market that's when you get you know a real explosive move in a real bull market but the the central bank buying and yeah that definitely has kept gold i that again that's why gold is at 2000 and not at 1700 right now but it but if gold prices were at 16 1700 i mean with the mining costs up the way they are the last three to five years uh we could see bankruptcies in a lot of these mining companies we could see even less supply we'd see as bad as supply problems are right now for potentially new gold mine supply, copper and silver mine supply going forward. I mean, we could see miners be bankrupt in the not too distant future because the capital available to build a lot of new gold mines or for miners who need a uh, cost of capital, like to repair a balance sheet, there's not a lot of cost, a lot of uh, low cost capital available. I mean, I guess if they want to go sell a silver stream or a gold stream byproduct to Franco Nevada, maybe, or one of those uh, streamers, maybe, but for a lot of investors and banks, the capital is just not available. I mean, it's is if metals prices went down to those levels, Jordan, uh, I think we'd be looking at bankruptcies and even worse supply problems. Yeah, and I, I don't even I don't even think they need to go down to those levels to have those issues, just because, as you said, the costs have gone up so much um, in the last three years. I mean, it, it, it's pretty remarkable, um, and, and it's devastated. A lot of companies, uh, because e- even just you know, and costs have gone up. I remember looking at something. I don't know if it tracked all the major producers, but it was something um, where I think it showed like the basically the cost of production was up. I think I want to say like forty percent in the last three years. I mean, which which sounds right to me. But e- even if costs just go up fifteen or twenty percent, um, 
it's ter- it's terrible for the industry because the economics yeah, you know, we look at these things and think, oh, well, if gold goes up 10 or 15 or 20 percent, you know, the stock can go up this much because the margins are going to expand so much. But, you know, the reverse is also true. And so, um, yeah, and you're looking at even development projects, you're looking at, uh, um, you know, the, the CapEx on these projects. I mean, if it three or four years ago if it cost 250 million to build now it's 350 million you know and the gold price is lower so the economics are shitty compared to what they were three or four years ago uh i mean rick rule said that development companies are the cheapest he's ever seen basically in his 50-year career he said that these are the cheapest and so i mean i'm starting to look at some of those um they're you know they're they're really really cheap and obviously they need a gold bull market uh, but if that comes to pass, you know, they'll they'll do really, really well because there's a lot of positive leverage. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, it, just the cost going up. It's, it's, it's a really difficult time for you know mining companies and juniors as well. And uh, it's, it's just you got you've got to see gold take out twenty one hundred. I mean, it sucks to just keep saying it, but that's just the reality for the industry. I mean, it's you get gold making a daily and weekly close above 2100 it's it's all i mean it's going to be all green grass on the other side but i mean it's quite the wall right now and and uh you know the industry and these companies are in purgatory until that happens well if you're the underlying businesses for low cost gold miners so if you're a low cost gold miner like a lending gold or agnico eagle your profit margins are still really good but like a barrack gold a newmont their costs are higher now so they're not low cost producers anymore but I know you you look at the charts a lot. There's inverse head and shoulders breakout patterns look like they're developing in what the GoAU, that's the low royalty and streaming company, exchange trade fund, uh, GDX, GDXJ. So it looks like the market is saying that potentially we just need the gold price to go higher, but the underlying businesses for some of these miners are doing okay, but you have to look at the, I guess, individual companies. So if they're a higher cost producer, they're not doing as well in this environment, but if metals prices go substantially higher, things could change over the next couple of quarters. Right. And those inverse head and shoulders patterns that have failed now, I mean, it, 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 and that's just what, that's what the gold, uh, the gold sector can do to you. It looked like there were, clean breakouts a couple weeks ago and now they've basically come all the way back and failed and you know that that happens a lot in this sector so you're not predicting but the the juniors though are in a bear market i mean the metals prices are relatively high so if you're a low-cost gold miner like i said lending gold agnico eagle your earnings the next couple quarters they're going to be good but if you're a junior, I mean, you're in a dire bear market. I mean, most juniors at, at these metals prices with the interest rates where they are, a lot of them can't raise any money. So we've started to see them start to sell out for pennies on the dollar to miners that actually could raise money. So do you think that that's going to continue in the near term until what the gold price gets to a certain level and stays there? I mean, it, 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 it everything's on a case by case basis and it also depends on who owns these stocks you know so a, a lot of these juniors you know may, maybe they would like to hold off for 3 or 4 years and you know, and capitalize on a bull market but um you know the big funds and organizations that own positions you know, they, they'll definitely, you know, when they've been sitting on things that have been losing money for two or three years and you could you can have a 20 or 30 percent pop in a day or two, they're definitely going to take that. So that that also plays into um, plays into the outcomes for these companies. But um, yeah, the, I think the juniors um, aren't the, sorry to interrupt you. The juniors for our listeners out there aren't familiar. The juniors aren't generating any cash flow. So they're paying out salaries. They're trying to cut expenses. But if they don't get private placements and raise capital to drill or to f- for salaries or geologists or exploration, whatever they're trying to do just to keep the lights on because they're not mining, they're not generating any cash flow. Um, it's going to be tough raising capital in this environment. Those funds that you said, uh, they don't seem interested in funding a lot of these juniors right now. Right. And, and the dilution, that's the other thing. I mean, people wonder, well, why are these costs here? Why are these stocks down 70 or 80% when the gold price is basically, you know, a whisper, uh, or a whiff away from an all time high? Well, 
because costs have gone up, like I said, 40% in the last three years. And so the economics on whatever they own, you know, whatever projects they have are, you know, 40 or 50% worse. Then you have to factor in the dil- dilution. Just think of, uh, just think of what these companies have to raise or, or just, yeah, they have to raise in the last two or three years and their stocks, their stock prices have been going sideways to lower. Uh, so that, I mean that, so you have, you know, 20 or 25% more shares than you did three years ago. So all, all these fact, and on top of that, this is something I've been thinking about, you know, the cost of everything because of inflation is so much higher than it was five years ago or even 10 or 15 years ago. So these companies have to, you know, you could, you know, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, you could do a great drill program with two or three or $4 million. Well, today to do the same kind of work, you you need to spend, you know, five, six, seven, eight million. So that's another, you know, and that leads to more shares outstanding. Like I'd want to talk to other people about this, it, you know, and they say, uh, because I started investing in these things in the early 2000s. And I remember, you know, like a good share, a, a good number of shares out would be maybe something that's below a hundred million. And, you know, something at 170 million, you, you kind of raise your eye at that. And if it had over 200 million, you'd say that's really bad. Um, well, you know, sure. today, uh, you know, it's, it's just normal for these companies to have two or 300 or, you know, some of them have 400 million shares. But you go back to the 90s, for example, you go back 30 years, like that was really rare. I mean, companies had 30 million shares out and they were doing all this work. There's way and more now capital. Just- There's way more capital sloshing around now, though. But Jordan, you, you, you've you been around gold stocks so long, you know that at some point these juniors, what they're going to do if they don't sell out, they're going to do reverse stock splits. So they're going to do a reverse stock split and then they're going to say we reduce the share count. But then unfortunately, they start a lot of them have a history of restarting the dilution again. Right. Yeah. Some, some have been doing that. And you know, that, that is, that may be an opportunity depending on the company. I mean, it's not an opportunity if you've been holding it and you have a big loss, but uh, you know, it depends on the project and all of that. But uh, yeah, that's definitely, um, that's definitely a possibility. I, I have seen a few going down that route already. Well, let me bring up some examples of the cost going up too. Uh, I've just seen in the last like six to 12 months, you're seeing a lot of companies that have a feasibility study out. So they're close. Maybe they can't raise all the capital right now to build a mine unless you're like a Cisco mining and you and you go out and get a joint venture partner like a Goldfields to help you build your uh, massive windfall mine in Quebec, which a lot of people were shocked that they had needed a partner. But in this environment, I mean, they're not going to share dilute then if they have a larger gold miner, that's their joint venture partner. But you're starting to see a lot of companies with those higher costs, and they're starting to redo their feasibility studies because all those economics that you're talking about, all those input costs, cost of capital for interest rates, um, uh, for electricity, diesel, materials, all those costs are up a lot when the feasibility study was even done two or three years ago. So they have to redo the feasibility study with all the economics to build the mine. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And in the yeah, it just the inflation, it just it 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 just hits. In just in multiple ways, just you know, beyond the obvious, it's just all these projects. You know, maybe you had these projects three years ago that were marginal or they were slightly economic. They're just they're never they're never going to be built now in these conditions. And so that's a lot of investors will wonder. They're like, oh well, this company, you know, they have three million out now. They have six million ounces, and uh, you know the the uh, you know the mine can generate this much. But you know, you you look at a lot of these there's the economics are not there i mean i just to give you some examples you know company a uh you know maybe the capex was 250 million and the npv was 600 million 3 or 4 years ago well now the capex is 350 million and the npv is like 400 million even though they've added you know maybe they've added their gold resources gone up by 50 or 70% it's just the economics are not there like none of these projects are going to get built in these conditions. I mean, it's it's just it's difficult to say, but uh, just the inflation has completely destroyed the economics of so many of these projects, and that's the only hope well, these companies have is you, you need to see 
gold break above 2100 and, and a real bull market began. Well, I would argue to offset all the uh, inflation rate for inflation adjusted with the consumer price index, we need the gold price well above 2300. I mean, we probably need 2500 gold prices to offset all the inflation in the US that we've had in the last, I don't know, three years. It needs to be way above 2100 to offset all the inflation. I was interviewing an oil hedge fund manager and he said the Saudis and OPEC are just disgusted with the current oil prices because he said if you factored in inflation, that a $75, $80 oil is about um, $55 oil. Inflation um, is, is the equivalent of like $55 oil from five years ago. So he said the Saudis are not happy at all with the current oil prices because all their costs are up too. Yeah, what's really interesting is from a bird's eye view, this is something I, I looked at, the inflation adjusted gold price is it's kind of an indicator for how gold stocks are going to perform because it it correlates pretty well with um gold mining margins. And so that that's something I have looked at, the inflation adjusted gold price. And you know, whenever we get gold above 2100, we're in a bull market, like you're going to see you're going to see that go to a new all-time hot. Like you can, there's a peak in 1980. There's a peak in 2011. We're still below that now, but so that that's, I mean, that's going to break out before silver does, obviously. But I mean, that's that's like a setting up to be like a 45 year breakout. I mean, I'm talking about the gold inflation adjusted gold price, so gold divided by uh, the the CPI. Um, so. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. And um, you know, you look at just you look at the monetary base, you look at gold against the S&P, like when gold goes into a real bull market, I, the 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 price and I know that people have been saying this for 5, 10 and 15 years, but when it goes into a real bull market, like this price it it's you're not going to see like 3,000 or 4,000. It's going way way higher than that. It's obviously taking a lot longer to begin that many people, including me have expected, but yeah, it's just math. And you look at these, you, you look at these charts historically, the inflation adjusted gold price, uh, gold against the monetary base, you know, gold against the S and P. I mean, that gold against the S and P that's peaked like at four or five X. Um, you know, I, I want to say like four or five or six times in the last 200 years, you know, where's the S and P today? I mean, it's at, Almost at, uh, I'm just pulling it up, 40, you know, almost 4,600. I mean, a four times that, that's almost 20,000. So the gold price, and I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow or in the next year. Uh, but, you know, again, when it, when it, when we do begin this new bull market and it's going to be a new secular bull market, like you're, you're going to see the gold, it's going to go much higher than people are expecting. And, uh, you know, that, that's why you're, you know, your, your comment is spot on that, you know, you, you look at gold, I, gold seems like it's, well, it's at 2000, it's near the all time high. It seems expensive, but when you plot that against the CPI, I mean, it's below where it was in 1980, you know, you plot yeah. that against the monetary base, um, it, the gold against the monetary base. I think it was, I think in early 2008, I think it was at, at one point it was backing almost 30% of the money that's out there. And now it's, you know, now it's like, I'm getting just guessing 6%. I can't recall the last time I looked at it, but it's, it's, uh, yeah. So you, you, you look at gold. I mean, there's a huge amount of value in gold when, when you look at it from a bird's eye view historically, and you look at all these relationships. Well, also in the current market conditions with interest rates, where they are cost of capital for the miners, the cost going up for the mining industry, especially because these miners, uh, a lot of them are operating in emerging market countries where labor costs, electricity, diesel, um, all those costs are up enormously. They're redoing their feasibilities. I just do not see a lot of new gold mines coming online the next five to seven years. The market conditions would have to change drastically. Metals prices would have to be higher. Cost of capital would have to be cheaper. There's just not the incentive for a lot of these um, juniors or or even the larger miners. I mean, there's a couple exceptions. There's a few really, really good gold mines that are, that are under construction now. Greenstone in Canada is almost done from Equinox Gold. 
And then you have uh, Osisco Mining with the Windfall pro uh, Project in Quebec. That one's getting funding, but they have a larger senior gold miner gold fields. And then you have Hadmaden in Turkey, which is going to get funded with uh, one of the largest corporations in Turkey and SSR Mining. But those are kind of exceptions to the role because they're such low cost projects and high grade copper and stuff like that. But the majority of these projects are not going to get any funding. I just don't see a lot of new gold mining supply coming online the next five to seven years unless market conditions change drastically. Yeah, and that's and and yeah, the next five to seven years, you're right, and that that's going to coincide with, uh, you know, gold and silver prices prices going crazy by that time. So we have demand. If we could wrap things up here in the interview, so we have strong private sector demand. What in China, India, emerging markets for physical gold because they have um, worse economies, currency devaluations, potentially worse inflation than the U.S. We have non-G7 central bank demand that is very strong the last couple of years, especially because of the Russia sanctions. Uh, those countries are not buying the U.S. treasuries that they used to. Maybe they're looking actually at the math problem that DCS was spending. So you have, and then on top of that, with the demand increases for physical gold from the places I just mentioned, you also have what supply problems too, potentially. Right. And I, I think, um, you know, to kind of, to kind of dumb it down, I don't mean, I don't mean that literally, but to keep things as simple as possible, the reality is this new secular bull market and gold, and then secondarily silver, it's going to begin when you have the next downturn in the U S stock market and the U S economy. I mean, historically, I use the 40-month moving average to kind of plot um, secular bull and bear markets in the U.S. stock market. And, you know, it's not it's not a perfect indicator, but for, for the most part, you know, when there's a secular bull market, the S&P holds above that moving average. In the last year or two, I mean, it's come down, it's tested it two or three times, it's rebounded. Um, so, you know, I think it's... Um, I'm just pulling it up. So right around, uh, okay. It's like, uh, sorry, I'm just pulling it up. Uh, okay. So the 40 month right now it's at 4150. Um, two months ago, the S and P bounced off it again. So when, you know, if in the next year, the S and P, you know, we have a recession market sells off. I've heard some people saying, you know, this could go to 3,300 or the low 3,000. It would definitely break below the 40 month moving average. So for me, that would be the signal that you're in a new secular bear market. And at the same time, obviously, if that happens, you know, the Fed would be cutting rates. Gold explodes above 2,100, you know, silver follows, it breaks above 30, eventually runs back to 50. Um, so it, the recession and the downturn in the S&P that is what is needed to trigger the start of this new secular bull market in precious metals. So that that's the most important focus. So we talked about the. Are you talking about like these general asset managers? So the, like these larger institutional investors that are they're not gold bugs. So they would then start to diversify their large pools of capital allocation out of stocks and say into gold and into bonds. Yes, exactly, and you know. Like I said before, the you know the central bank buying the physical demand, all of that is why the the gold price has held up so well. You know why it's at two thousand and not seventeen hundred, but it's it's all that you know it's all the conventional financial people, you know, it, it, and and they don't have to put. It's just they don't own any gold or gold. It's zero for them. I mean, if they all just go one or two percent in, you know, you have this massive bull market, and so they're not going to they're not going to take that plunge until you have the next recession in the stock market rolls over i mean may, maybe it's not a recession maybe it's stagflation and you know it kind of develops that way but big picture that's what's needed and again you know i i, I look at the you know mid to late 60s as kind of the best comparison for where we are and the first thing that happened then, we were talking about earlier about how the 10-year yield, you know, it broke above the 1920 high at 5%. The bond market, like the, the bull market and bonds, that ended first in the, the mid-1960s. You know, then eventually that caused uh, the secular bull in the stock market to end. 
And so that's why this is setting up to be as explosive as a bull market in the 70s, Jason, because you're going to have a secular bear in bonds and a secular bear in stocks. You go back to 2001 to 2011, you only had a secular bear in stocks. You know, bonds were in a bull market at the same time. So this is a really, really powerful setup for gold and silver. But again, it's all coming back to the point, you know, we need to see that next downturn in the stock market, in the economy. And when that happens, gold is going to shoot through 2100 and really fly and carry silver with it. And, you know, gold's been, it's been getting really close to that point in the last year, but it's just, unfortunately, it's not quite there yet. Uh, but you know, I, I do think at some point this year it's going to happen. And there's a lot of false narratives out there with the Fed rate cuts and we're going to have a soft landing. I'm hearing that inflation is dead. The Fed has succeeded in engineering a soft landing and stopping inflation. The CPI is headed back down to 2%. I honestly do not think inflation is dead here in the real world. And then also, if you look back in the 70s, inflation, the stagflation, it came in waves. So Arthur Burns thought he had beaten inflation. He stopped with the rate hikes. The inflation took a break. It went temporarily went back down. And then the next wave of stagflation inflation had picked back up. I think we could see something similar play out in the next 6, 12, 18 months too. Yeah, and w- talking about the waves and one more important point about that comparison to the uh, the late 60s, the first wave of inflation, the stock market went up. But it was once you got the second wave, then it was, you know, fucked for, sorry, for lack of a better description. Uh, so the, yeah. Fubar. Yeah. So, do, yeah. So, but during the first wave, when it went up, you know, in, in the mid 1960s, when it, when inflation, inflation broke out, I think 64, 65. So inflation was going up. The stock market went up in that first wave of inflation. But after that, it was, it was FUBAR, as you said. So that's why it, it, it you know, the long term inflation problem. Yeah, it, it might come down some more if we have a recession this year, but it's going to be the next wave higher. You know, then when it really hurts bonds, the stock market is doing shitty in real terms, and then all the you know gold and silver are going crazy. You know, that's what what things are setting up for. Yeah, that would be more of a risk off environment, but I think the gold stocks after a couple of good quarters of good earnings. So I think we're going to start to see over the next couple of quarters, the gold stocks are not pricing in anywhere close to the current metals prices, even the royalty companies. I mean, Franco Nevada, they have their one specific asset, but the earnings for the rest of their portfolio are still going to be really good for the next couple of quarters. So I think the people are the investors are going to start to look at the earnings for some of these companies over the next couple of quarters and say at the current gold price versus uh, the earnings for the company excuse me, relative to the current metals price. I mean, the, there's huge mispricings here for some of these companies, especially the low cost producers that still have good profit margins. Yeah, because once you get once you get this breakout above 2100, you know, I have there's the you know measured upside target of 3000. I have one as high as 4000, but kind of in a short medium term basis, there are measured upside targets of 2300, 2500. But you know, you you break above 2100 and you get to 2300, 2350. I mean, that's just the way this is, you know, we've seen how this, you know, cost going up, we've seen how that's devastated these companies, but the ones that are producing, um, you know, and like you said, even the low cost companies, you know, from gold going to 2050 to 2350, I mean, three, that's $300 an ounce, you know, that that's going to add so much to these companies. You know, and then when the market discounts an actual real bull market, then the valuations on these companies are going to go up as well. And that, I mean, that's how you turbocharge the gains. Yeah. Or if your management and the market's not pricing this in correctly and you have all that free cash flow, you either go out and do acquisitions or you go back and buy your shares and that'll turbocharge your stock further. So I think we'll see that it'll be, it depends on metals prices, but if the metals prices stay at these levels for the low cost miners, like uh, the two ones I mentioned earlier, or the royalty companies, and they're all like, the earnings are going to be very good for all of them. They're going to have a lot of free cash flow, good profit margins. Next next couple quarters are going to be very good. And the uh, valuations on those companies, they're not reflecting the metals prices at all. Right. I mean, they're, I mean, they're, they're historically low. Because and that's what happens. I mean, you're you're three years into a cyclical bear, and um, the market and investors are you know they're disgusted, and so the valuations start to trail off because of the, the sentiment is so terrible. But again, you get gold, you get gold breaking above twenty one hundred, and this happens in the stock market too. I mean, when you're coming off a bottom and you're beginning a new bull market. 
the biggest gain the biggest gain is from the valuation increase because valuations at these bottoms you know they they just plummet and they're so low and then when things go back to normal or you think there's actual recovery or things are going well the, the valuations go up significant significantly in a short period of time yeah or there's mergers and acquisitions cuz the capital's not available so if you're a junior you're going to be calling up on the phone to the larger companies trying to do a joint venture deal or to sell your company out. Or there could be, if you're a larger company and you have the free cash flow with those margins, a low-cost producer or a larger royalty company, you see how cheap some of these other companies are, you're going to go buy stuff. So yeah, in the short term, your stock may get hit for an acquisition, but long-term, it's probably smart if you're buying assets at huge discounts because then the future cash flows are going to be enormous. Yeah, and the potential acquirers you know, one, once gold breaks twenty one hundred, you know the the money obviously goes into the seniors, the the larger companies first, and it trickles down. But larger companies, their stocks go up first. You know, they have an advantage; they're making more money. Their stock price is stronger. Then they can use that currency to, uh, you know, make these acquisitions at a at a, you know, at, at a real discount before, uh, things in the juniors and uh, those types of companies really catch up. Yeah, it's just bear market conditions, though, for, for these gold and silver stocks. So it's counterintuitive because you look at the cost for some of the low-cost producers and you think that their earnings would be great, that the shares would be pricing in good valuations, but they're just not. So the smaller companies are the ones getting hit the most, though, because those ones, I don't know if they could raise capital at this point. It's it's looking pretty dire for them. Yeah, the the dilution... We talked about it earlier. The the share dilution. I mean, it, it's just a killer. I mean, you you factor in three years of that on top of the cost inflation. It, it it's just a killer. Well, you've been in the sector as long as I have. I mean, I think Coeur d'Alene and I used to be a shareholder many many years ago. Before I understood all the crazy games the miners were playing, I think they did over half a dozen reverse stock splits in the last like fifteen or twenty years with one of their old CEOs who retired. I think in like twenty fifteen or twenty sixteen. And so he cashed out for, I think, over $30 million in stock options and high salaries while he did, I think, half a dozen share dilutions in the 15 years he was CEO. So, I mean, there's like some of these mining companies, they don't die. (laughs) They don't go bankrupt. They just do creative financing. And the juniors, unfortunately, are kind of the same way. So there's like, if you go to these gold conferences, you'll see a junior that was there 10, 15 years ago advertising the same project, they don't get any funding. They managed, well, they don't get any funding to build the mine. They get enough funding to keep the lights on. And if you you have to go back and do the research and figure out that, I don't know, they've changed the name of the company, they've done, they switched over to uranium or some other type of commodity briefly, then they switched back to another one and they've done all these share dilutions and then reverse stock splits along the way, like a pattern of these things alternating. That's that's what they got to do to stay alive. Uh, Well, I don't want to invest in those companies, but I'm just warning people that like, that's why I don't gamble on the juniors. (laughs) Yeah, that's why I focus mostly on uh, what I call the growth oriented producers, companies that are producing or they're really close to producing because they'll generate cash flow and then they, you know, they're leveraged to a bull market. I mean, everything's leveraged to a bull market. But uh, you know, companies that are generating cash flow, uh, they're still risky, but they're you know less risky than most. You're just not going to see because the capital's not available for the juniors. You're just not going to see all the crazy waste, fraud, corruption, and abuse that there was. I would say from like 2005 to 2013. I mean, there was an insane amount. Just hearing stories from Rick Roll and Nolan Watson of Sandstorm Gold. I mean, there was tons of absolute wasted capital. From a lot of these junior miners, I don't think the capital is available for that at this point. Yeah, but I mean, if if we do get a bull market, and it's a multi year bull market, like I think it will be, then you know a lot of that, a lot of those shenanigans and tomfoolery will be coming back in some form. Well, it's going to take a couple of years. We're going to need gold prices probably twenty three hundred or higher, and then that um, those generalist fund managers, like you were saying, the capital is going to have to go away from stocks and some of those other, and maybe tech companies, some of the normal risk on assets, and then it's going to have to be diverted into gold. Yeah, I think I think it'll take more than twenty three hundred. I'd probably I'd probably say three thousand. Wow. 
Yeah, there's a, those, a lot of these generalist fund managers are like old school Warren Buffett or, or they're pro technology companies because they like paying higher valuations for tech companies here in the US. So they are very anti commodity, very anti non ESG energy, and they're very anti precious metals. You're starting to see them like buy, they're chasing uranium right now, like it's window dressing, like they missed the, a lot of the big move in uranium over the last like 12 months. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I mean, high prices, you know, always bring in new buyers, even those who uh, it's, it's not their expertise or forte. Yeah, I mean, I was interviewing uranium experts. I was writing about it for the last couple of years, telling people that there was going to be a new uranium bull market. And uh, uh, tons of people are skeptical about Cameco. And it looks like just in the last couple of weeks, they're talking uh, the the people running these governments are actually talking about tripling nuclear power capacity over the next couple of decades. So we'll see if it happens, but they're at least talking about it, which is better than the anti-nuclear stance that most of them have had the last 15 or 20 years. Yeah, they have no choice. They're going to have to go nuclear. Well, especially because all the all the money was wasted. All the wind, solar, biofuels, these things have like their enormous losses, negative return on investment. Uh, Germany is literally bailing out uh, the wind and solar divisions for Siemens. So, I mean, like the proof is all the failures and wasted amounts of capital. Well, I really enjoyed our discussion today, Jordan. I've kept you for around an hour. I think you've highlighted what it will take for the next leg of the gold bull market to restart. So we had a false break out there with the inverse head and shoulders pattern. We're back in a trading range. There's still strong demand keeping gold in a trading range. We talked about where the demand's coming from. But for the big move up in gold, you said that the generalist fund managers, so these are like the large pools of capital, the institutional investors, the pension funds, they need to start allocating to gold and gold stocks. And we're not seeing that yet. Right. And so that that only happens after or during uh, you, you get a bear market at a downturn in the U.S. So if my listeners want to take a look at Daily Gold, what types of products and services do you offer and how do they follow you on Twitter? Uh, my Twitter is at the Daily Gold. Uh, my YouTube channel is also uh, youtube.com slash the daily gold. I post a lot of interviews, um, video analyses that I do. Um, I also, I mean, I post everything at the daily gold.com. Um, I have a free newsletter that I think you can opt into somewhere at the daily gold.com. Uh, there's also, um, there's a section on my website called the daily gold university where I'm not done with it, but I've published a lot of videos, probably, I don't know, maybe nine or 10 so far. Uh, just you can, you can, uh, become educated with, uh, it's not I, probably like an hour or two of content, uh, watching these videos. I try and keep it as simple as possible. Um, and I have a premium service where I, I do lots of, macro technical analysis and then i write about the juniors that i'm investing in kind of why i'm investing in them i do company reports i look at what's the downside you know what what's the upside potential if we're going into a bull market uh, so i do fundamental analysis on the companies and then lots of technical analysis on um uh the the stocks you know gold silver the s p things like that so i, I take a uh, a big picture view. I like looking at history and you know, drawing a lot of the parallels. So a lot of my work focuses on that and you know the parallels and similarities. Well, I think we're in a historically unprecedented times because of the total global debt and the the dollar, uh, excuse me, the U.S. federal government with its budget deficits and how there's a lack of foreign demand now for U.S. Treasury. So we're in very interesting times now. Absolutely. And it'll probably continue to stay that way for another decade or two. Yeah, all these fiat currencies, they're all being devalued. It's a it's a race to debase. So, I mean, like it's it's just a total mess for all these government finances. Um, the stories I'm hearing about a uh, Chinese yuan devaluation soon, uh, Japan, the Japanese yen was at a what, a 30 or 40 year devaluation level to the dollar. So it's it's a mess across the board. Um 
I don't know if we concede like all the asset price inflation and the central bank balance sheet expansion. We'll have to see. This system is a mess, though. Yeah, and that's a big reason why gold and silver uh, as, and other commodity prices, but I'd say gold and silver especially, why they're going much, much higher over the coming years, the next decade. 